ask to sort of sweep up at the end of the day and give reflections back on what the discussion was. That did not allow me to prepare any slides in advance, of course, so I've just been madly taking notes as everyone has been debating and talking. And therefore, I have little notes here and little notes here, so quite a mess. Uh, but I'll do my best. Uh, so I think I was asked to speak because I have a long history of acquaintance with cohort study research. Not as long as David's, uh, but fairly long nevertheless. And I'm going to speak, I've been given 25 whole minutes, so you, if you look at your program, you'll see that it's that quite a bit of time. I'm not going to use that. I can finish in under half of that time, I believe. And I, what I, I think our time is better spent debating with each other, so everyone gets a, a chance to have input here at the end of the day. It's been quite an exhilarating day. I'm aware that we have some people who are, have come uh, from... Uh, uh, the bad direction of jet lag, so uh, some people are, it's one in the morning for them, so I'll try to be kind. So, what is it about my, I want to tell you my credentials that would give me a perspective on, on uh, cohort study research, um, and particularly with the evidence for better life studies. So, in the 1980s, I did my PhD research in the Danish high-risk longitudinal cohort that was begun in the 1960s. And then after that, I uh, directed the Dunedin Longitudinal Study, which takes place in New Zealand. And that study's been going on for 50 years. I've been part of it for about 30 years. Um, following the children from birth to their late 40s with 14 waves of assessment. I even met my husband when our posters were side by side <laughs> at a life history society meeting. So I fall in love in the course of cohort research. I really recommend it. <laughs> and <laughs> I remember that. But did you? <laughs> uh, and I also recommend the life history uh, society meeting uh, for the members of this group. It will meet in Oxford uh, this uh, spring and summer. Uh, so it's a, it's a group of professionals who follow cohorts. Um, in the 1990s, I moved here to Britain and launched the Environmental Risk Longitudinal Cohort Study, um, which has followed uh, people from the 1990s until now they're in their late 20s, and we've had five uh, successful waves of data collection, and we're planning a new assessment now, for which we're trying to raise money, so I feel your pain. Uh, here we have the EBLS, which is an unbelievable project, uh, and we're at the stage, uh, once again, of fundraising. And now I've, I'm collaborating with many leading well-known cohort studies uh, in the United States, in the UK, uh, and in Scandinavia, and in Brazil. Uh, and I just finished the last two weeks, I was in Norway meeting with the Norwegian Mother Baby uh, Study, uh, which has now added fathers, by the way, so we can benefit from some of their experience. So, what have I learned? from all of this that could inform us about how special the EBLS is and what kind of great unique potential it has. So uh, I want to I make just maybe seven points. Um, and I'm, what I've tried to focus on today is noting um, what the grants managers at King's College London call USPs, unique selling points. So these are aspects of the research approach or the research design that I think really are special, uh, unique to this study, make a unique combination that should be uh, appealing, I think, to funders. So I just, I'll point those out a little bit. Uh, so the first one is, and now I moved my paper, uh, is that the EBLS is really special and has a unique selling point because it has its initial focus, organizing conceptual focus, around violence. And I think I've, I've heard everyone speak here today with a very optimistic and hopeful kind of atmosphere in the room uh, in which we all hope that violence against women and children and men uh, will be decreasing. We have this expectation. So we're really hoping that we'll meet those <coughs> WHO goals to reduce violence against women and children by 20% soon. But I want to invite you to consider a scenario in which these reductions might not happen. Um, so let's think about some macro trends that are happening now. Um, <coughs> first of all, um, 
these trends are accelerating in the countries that are now in EBLS. Uh, the birth rates are dropping, okay? There are more babies are surviving these days, but family sizes are shrinking. And this means that women are now freed up from child care and child bearing uh, and can go out to work outside the home. Uh, families are therefore moving into cities uh, and uh, into circumstances of crowding and urban poverty. Uh, traditional men's jobs are being whittled away. They're being displaced by automation and by artificial intelligence. And we're only seeing the beginning of this now, but it's, economists ensure us it's going to get more and more aggressive. Um, men's jobs are also being whittled away by women. So employers now prefer to hire female employees uh, over male employees in, in most sectors of the economy. Um, Think of doctors, engineers. These are jobs that used to be traditionally male. They're becoming increasingly female. The proportion of the population who have work that is engaging and meaningful uh, is going to decline. Uh, that is, this is the kind of work that provides uh, bonds to society, uh, the kind of work, the kind of jobs that provide a feeling of making a contribution to your country and having a sense of personal honor, uh, a sense that have, you have a perception that you have a central, um, uh, uh, an element of control over your life and over your family's life. Uh, and you put this kind of loss of personal control and loss of honor together <coughs> with urban crowding um, and a lack of belonging and a lack of investment in the family. And I think this is setting the stage for potentially more violence in the family instead of less. So this one thing that this would point to is the study of fathers. I know this is under discussion, but they are going to be disproportionately affected by these societal changes in ways that may stimulate greater violence in the home. So that's unique selling point number one. Uh, unique selling point number two is that the EVLS is planned ahead from the outset. It's conceptualized and designed as a longitudinal cohort study with subsequent waves envisioned in advance and outcome variables envisaged in, uh, for years into advance. Most other cohort studies have not been planned ahead uh, and they have major flaws as a result. Uh, even the celebrated uh, early British cohorts were initially, each of them envisaged as a one-off survey. Uh, only years later was any effort made to find the survey participants again and conduct follow-up assessments of them. Uh, now, there are huge advantages of having a vision from the outset. Um, you can recruit the sample size that you need to be able to allow for attrition so that you still have enough statistical power 15, 20, 30 years from now. Uh, you can plan for your staff members' professional development uh, through the career pathway with the study. You can collect measurements now that might not be useful at the moment, but that will only become useful many years later uh, when at that time they'll become essential predictors of important life outcomes at older ages. So having an advanced plan is really a unique selling point. And I think this is pretty special to EBLS. The fact that we're all here doing this now is, is pretty remarkable. The third unique selling point is that EBLS is not, a narrowly, not narrowly focused on one type hypothesis or just even one topic area. It does have an organizing principle as, as a starting point to focus on uh, violence in the family, uh, but it's not necessarily limited to that vision. Uh, now, some uh, longitudinal cohort studies have focused on one central hypothesis or topic area, such as genetics, uh, or nutrition, or heart disease, uh, but these studies have not been as broadly successful over the years as studies that have diversified um, their portfolio of measurements across many disciplines, the way EBLS is doing. Uh, the EBLS uh, study is eclectic in that sense, and that's a unique selling point. 
It's intended to grow and adapt as the children and their families grow older. So the key here to data collection is to measure as much as you can that captures what's important at the developmental stage of the child at each way. At the moment, we're all talking about what's important to measure in the third trimester of pregnancy, what's important to measure at 12 months, 24 months, 36 months. Uh, that kind of thinking will continue and will unfold as the children age. Now, when the Dunedin study uh, began in the 1970s, um, 45 minutes was enough to test each of the children's milestones in language, motor, and social behavior. And a further 90 minutes was added on to interview mothers about family life. And that was really the assessment. Uh, today, 50 years later, uh, the Dunedin study members spend one and a half days with us. Uh, and they sleep overnight in a hotel uh, between assessments. I'll tell you some of the modules. Uh, they receive uh, modules, each lasting about 30 to 50 minutes, for mental health and substance abuse, cardiovascular health and physical function, respiratory medicine assessment and asthma, an assessment of musculoskeletal health and pain, um, uh, testing of cognitive functions and neuropsychological testing of memory, uh, interviews about their work, their life, their finances, their family life with their spouses and children and grandchildren. They receive a life events calendar. Uh, they get an examination by a dentist. They have interviews about crime and family violence. They have their hearing tested. They have their vision tested. They get interviewed about their sex lives and reproductive health and menopause and infertility. Uh, they get a scan of the retina and they get a scan of the brain and they give blood. Um, I'd like to just mention too that each of these topics is paid for by a different funder. So this has allowed us to diversify our portfolio. It's a lot of proposal writing, a lot of fundraising, but it's, that's what's kept the study alive for 50 years, is making it eclectic and multidisciplinary. And as life expands, the study expands. Uh, I think there's clear potential for EBLS to grow into this kind of rich multidisciplinary project uh, over time. Uh, so what you need to do really and what you are doing is starting with a very solid base uh, in pregnancy and then grow in breadth, in breadth as the children grow. So capacity for multidisciplinarity and growth is certainly a unique selling point of the way the study is now being planned ahead. Fourth unique selling point. Virtually all prior cohort studies, and in fact, almost all prior studies of human development of any sort, using any method, have been based in a single location. EBLS is clearly global. It's the first ever and only cohort study, study that's designed from the outset to allow comparison across multiple nations and multiple cultures. Um, why is this important? Uh, the world is now connected in a way that's making the concept of nation-state borders grow outmoded. People are on the move around the globe. They're moving from the southern hemisphere, migrating to the northern hemisphere. They're also moving latitudes when you look at young people who are moving from China and India to Europe and the Americas uh, in order to study. Uh, I anticipate, and, and some geographers uh, are writing about, how this, um, this is soon going to reverse in the next 20 to 30 years. Uh, Americans and Europeans are going to be going in the other direction. Understanding now how children are developing in this unprecedented modern multinational context is going to be essential. And yet when I look around, and I always do, for data to inform a scientific question on child development and try to cross cultures, um, I can't find any data. Okay, so I'm doing research in Norway, and where am I able to go to get another cohort to compare my data to and test for replication? Norway and New Zealand, you know, how different are these places, really? Um, so, um, I do think that 
uh, what we have is, uh, is the clear signal that the EBLS is a huge step change in the direction of international diversity. Uh, the societies where EBLS is located are changing very fast, and the children who are being born in EBLS today are going to live uh, in a very different world in 10 or 20 years from now. So being open-minded about the types of data to collect is going to be an enormous advantage for documenting the effects of rapid societal change um, in these nations on children, women, and families. So I think it's that we're in a, a special part of history and EBLS is being planned to really make a match to that aspect of his, history, which is rapid social change on an international scale. Okay, fit, I'm getting a little worked up here, you see, uh, but I'm quite excited about this. So fifth, fifth unique selling point, uh, and then only three to go. Okay, uh, EBLS has articulated the aim of connecting to policy from the outset. I heard a lot about this today. Uh, this is strange to me. I've never connected to policy in my entire working life. Uh, to my knowledge, all prior cohort studies have had policymakers and practitioners as a long afterthought, if any thought at all. And worse yet, many cohort researchers wish policymakers will stay away from us and not muddle up our science. And connecting to policy seems to me to be a daunting challenge. Uh, and this difficulty is in part because the cohort study takes a long view. As David Farrington told us, the problem with them is they take a long time. A cohort study goes on for many years. It generates value and information mainly over the long haul. Policymakers, on the other hand, tend to churn a lot. They move from their posts rather more quickly. They switch from right wing to left wing party-wise uh, over time. They tend to need results that they can point to in one political cycle. It's hard for scientists to keep up with the policy world. To me, an interesting aspect of the EBLS is that the study team has made real concrete advances in engaging <coughs> policymakers from the outset. Uh, like those of you who are here today from the policy world, uh, you don't know how special it is that you're allowed inside the room when a cohort study is being planned. I think it's maybe <laughs> the first time in history that that has happened. So this EBLLS team is very open and very brave. Um, uh, they're also involve, involving policy stakeholders in the local countries where the country that, where the study has its sites. So that's pretty special too. This team has the aim of making the science use inspired, using the input of practitioners and policymakers to shape the data collection protocols. And this is going to be an unprecedented uh, process and most likely a real advantage in making the science have impact. So I think that when we talk about how you know, raising questions uh, like Marinus did about people are asking in the Netherlands, how much impact is the uh, study in Rotterdam having, um, this study may be able to be different because it's engaging policymakers from the outset and is, is willing to do that extra work. Okay, sixth unique selling point. EBLS is the ultimate team science. I've spent the weekend with this group. It's really quite amazing watching them work together. Uh, they've already achieved the unthinkable. That's bringing together a team of researchers from many different countries and cultures and languages who have never collaborated before, to, and they now work together like a smoothly oiled machine. Um, I've, I've visited recently the Nobel Prize Museum in Stockholm, and if you haven't been to the Nobel Museum, it's really a fantastic thing. The best thing about it is that it has a theater that runs a loop of documentary films constantly, and these are 10-minute films, each of them on the most creative science teams in the world across history, going back pretty far. Um, all of these teams have something in common. If you sit there for hours and watch these films, you'll notice it. They operated like a family. There's a certain warmth and caring in them, 
Uh, the scientists achieve great things because the group provides an emotional support net that allows them to develop intellectual freedom and take intellectual risks and be more creative because they know the other people in the group care about the same goals and the same successes and understand the process. So I could really see uh, launching a research project to study the evolution of team science in EBLS uh, as a sociology of science study. So certainly this is going to be a wonderful laboratory to study science leadership, uh, science training of uh, early career researchers, and then as a last note on this business about team science, we need to keep in mind that the families in the cohort are key parts of the team. Um, so this is an amazing kind of unprecedented team science that, that's really quite uh, special and we should keep, it, keep that in mind. Okay, seventh and last uh, unique selling point. Uh, that is, a cohort study is a major scientific tool. We need to think about it like a particle collider or a space station uh, or a radio telescope. It requires constant care, constant maintenance, constant upkeep, constant feeding, and this requires utter devotion from the research leaders at each site. A cohort study becomes your life's work. It's a partnership between the families who belong to the cohort and the scientists who study them. And this kind of a partnership takes nurturing and trust and goodwill uh, and communication sustained day in and day out. You can never get irritable and tired and slip and be rude to one of the families. You know, you're always working to sustain the cohort study. A cohort study won't work if the staff turn over every couple of years. So if you're sitting here in this room and you're starting this project now, um, you should know that it's going to be with you until after your retirement. <laughs> um, Cohorts become increasingly seductive over time. They pull the researchers and the funding agencies into themselves like a sort of a giant python, you know, wrapping around and absorbing, uh, squeezing a prey. Uh, so uh, this is because there's more and more value added with each additional assessment and each additional stage of the cohort members' lives that are covered. So virtually all cohort studies begin with a few terrific signature published findings from the very first wave. But then, as the children grow older, the capacity to predict behavior and out health outcomes over longer and longer intervals of years is developed in a cohort study, along with the capacity to discover new knowledge about how processes of life unfold. So as again in the Deneen study, the one I know best, we can now show that performance on a test of standing on one leg, how long can you do that? Not very long for me because I'm over 60. But when you're three years old, how long you can stand on one leg now predicts 50 years later uh, the age of one's brain on MRI scan. So this is kind of amazing. And it has all kinds of implications for understanding brain health and aging. Um, knowledge like this is power. And cohort studies generate enormous amounts of this kinds of knowledge, just floods of it. Uh, but running one successfully is an all-consuming life's work. Uh, the team that's here at Cambridge and at each country in the EBLS, I think, are very brave and potentially suicidal to start this, <laughs> this life's work. <laughs> so I really want to you know, point out your unique selling points that I think you're, you're working on. I want to pay res my respects to your vision, uh, and, and I wish you the stamina that this is going to take. So. Okay.